Kommunikation im Kanzleramt, Fragen und so weiter. Wenn, wenn Englisch ein Problem sein sollte, können auch Fragen bei der Diskussionsrunde natürlich dann auf Deutsch gestellt werden und werden dann übersetzt. Wenn jemand von Ihnen Polnisch, Schlesisch kann, umso besser. Oder andere Sprachen, schade. Um, the question is, is it fine with you all here if we are going to record that meeting? Because there are some people interested who cannot join and then probably we'll send it to them or post it even on, on the internet. Is that fine? Mm -hmm. If there is anybody who is not okay with that, please tell us and we're going to cut that part so you said something. Okay, so. I'm going to start the international part. Um, here's um, the actual reader of today's evening. My name is Adam. Thank you for coming. Um, what can I say about Mr. Professor Tomasz Kamuzela? Originally from Silesia, I studied in Silesia, in Prague, and in South Africa. He was the first one who was having a job in Poland for integration, integration matters when it comes to the European Union. It was in Opel, Opole, so Upper Silesia. Then he was also working at the university in Opole. After that, he transferred to Ireland, but he was a lecturer at the Trinity College Dublin for three years, I guess. And from 2012, he's a reader at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland at the School of History. His topics are policy of language, minorities, ethnicities, genocide, and many other topics. The last publication was last year, 2021, in Rutledge, uh, London, and the topic was politics and the Slavic languages. Um, he did his research in many institutes and institutions and universities, for example, in cooperation with Japan, was in Sapporo, yeah. uh, Washington DC, the Congress Library, Kluge uh, Center, the yeah, Kluge Center, Center. Center. Right. also the Hanna Institute here in Gießen, or Marvo, and Vienna as well. So, uh, how we plan today's evening. First of all, we're going to start with a short impulse for a fact, so an uh, introduction from his side, about 20 minutes about the topic, which is why do the Polish Germans speak Silesian? <laughs> um, about the minority languages and the situation of minorities in Upper Silesia. And then afterwards, please join the uh, discussion, which we uh, assume will be probably a dialogue. As I mentioned before, if you've had any struggles with the languages, there are many people who can help. <laughs> and feel free to join. That's it from my side. Thank you very much. And now uh, I will give the voice to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to Artis Liberales for hosting me. Thank you a lot uh, uh, to Adam for organizing it. That was his initiative. I happened to be in Vienna to want to drop by, see the beautiful town of Heidelberg and others. Okay, that I should uh, talk. So fine. Uh, uh, without, uh, uh, I wouldn't like to prolong, so I will just start in a moment, Adam, when we are kind of approaching 20 minutes and, uh, you know, just beak on me, so I'm not uh, going over time. So, we are talking, for, uh, you, you know, uh, in uh, 1990, in post, freshly post-communist Poland, the German minority was uh, recognized. It was a big thing uh, uh, for Europe, for Germany, and for Poland, because from the formal point of view, uh, during the communist period, especially after the wrapping up uh, of the wartime uh, expulsions, Vertreibung, as, uh, as you know it, from history in Germany, in, more or less in 1952, the state authorities were maintaining that there were no Germans in Poland. Yeah, that's it. Uh, uh, so, the recognition came to the people concerned as a relief that at long last they can be Germans in Poland as they want to be. It came as uh, also a relief uh, to the uh, West German and then uh, the authorities of U uh, reunited Germany because they were afraid if these people 
were, had not been recognized as Germans, they would have been basically expelled or escaping or migrating as refugees, as Hitler's, uh, to West Germany. At that time, West Germany obviously was dealing with refugees from East Germany and from the post-Soviet countries. Yeah. So, uh, Bonn, as the capital was then, was very much interested in keeping these people in Upper Side yeah. because that's the area where the minority is. So they got recognized. You can have a look at the map of recognized minorities of Europe or within the European Union. You have always this region mark here, that's the German minority. When it comes to statistics, in 1990 there was no census because the communist government or the fresh post-communist government didn't have money for it, so they didn't run. Uh, any census which should be run every decade or so. Uh, so actually it was the West German embassy in Warsaw which was collecting uh, declarations of German nationality from these areas where the German minority people live and uh, they collected around 350,000. So quite a sizable number as many who could uh, say. <coughs> Later on, uh, the census uh, after 2001 showed, uh, show, still show that uh, the number of the German uh, members of the German minority is around 150,000. Uh, you can see that small or big. However, uh, from the statistical point of view in Poland, it is the largest. Uh, 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 Minor, recognized minority in today's Poland. Okay, so that's the situation. And obviously on the paper they have uh, the right to education, they have the right to the organization, they have the right to participation in political life. Yet, if you go uh, uh, to Poland, to the regions officially inhabited by the German minority, you will you will find uh, you will not find even a smallest uh, locality or city quarter where German would be uh, the language of everyday communication. And actually, in everyday life, these uh, people speak the Silesian language, which is uh, a kind of uh, Slavic la uh, language. Yes, close to Polish. Yes, close to the Czech, uh, uh, in, in Poland, uh, officially, it is considered to be a dialect of Polish. Uh, the people who speak it consider it uh, a language in its own right. Uh, uh, I always personally believe in the democratic approach to such choices, so we should be listening uh, to the wishes of the people who speak something and they call it a language and they decide it's a language so they have the right to call it a language. Yeah, yes, it is basically a political uh, decision. Okay, what happened? You could ask, yeah. How come that this um, German minority, member of the German minority, do not uh, speak uh, German? Uh, uh, obviously, in Central Europe, we have ethnolinguistic nationalism as the most important uh, form of uh, nationalism, which is very different from other parts of the world where it is basically citizenship, which is enough to be a member of a nation. Uh, so, it, uh, to many people in Poland uh, and, else, and outside Poland, but in extra Central Europe, it appears as a kind of liability. Yeah? So, that's why many Polish nationalists or uh, uh, politicians of uh, anti-German attitudes, they say that these people are not real German, yeah, because they don't speak the German language. And in order uh, to be a member of uh, a nation defined in ethno-linguistic terms, you should be able to uh, speak the language of the nation. These people did speak, the community did speak uh, German until 1940. Fine. Let us not forget about it. And uh, 
uh, uh, uh, obviously, if, if you look at Upper Silesia uh, prior uh, to the Second World War, um, the population was speaking uh, several uh, languages. Uh, Upper Silesia, if you look at it uh, from the perspective of uh, dialect continua, uh, is play, used to be placed uh, at the meeting point between the Germanic dialect continuum and the North uh, Slavic dialect uh, continuum. So in eastern uh, uh, half of the Upper Silesia, people were speaking more the local Slavic dialect, which nowadays uh, we see as a Silesian language. And uh, obviously, uh, beginning uh, uh, with the turn of the um, 19th century, uh, both uh, in Prussia and uh, in the Austrian Empire, uh, uh, elementary, compulsory elementary school for everyone was gradually enforced. That's why uh, by um, the 1870s, all people in this region were attending school and were literate in German. Uh, in 1849, because a lot of these people were kind of Silesian speaking, uh, speaking in Slavic, and they didn't have at home exposure to German before the internet, TV, and so on and so on, radio. Uh, uh, so uh, the Archbishop uh, of Breslau, uh, Suffragan Bishop of Breslau, Bogadain, decided that maybe it would be useful to, to teach formally in the initial uh, years of elementary school uh, through the medium of standard Polish, which was not used somehow at, at, uh, uh, at that time. Why Bogadain decided like this? Because his idea was it would be easier for these people to get some literacy in standard Polish, which is closer to the speech, and it would be like a stepping stone to getting literacy in German. Interestingly, Upper Silesia, I'm not going into details of its borders, for, because of the wars between Prussia and the Habsburgs, uh, was also divided uh, between arch uh, diocese of Olmitz, Olomot, and the diocese of Breslau. Uh, at the same time, in 1849, uh, in southern uh, part of Upper Silesia, which uh, belonged to the uh, Archdiocese of uh, uh, Olmitz, uh, the, the local, uh, I mean, the Olmitz uh, uh, Archdiocese Suffragan took the decision that uh, in, uh, they would start using the local speech of the people there as the language of education in the initial uh, schools, uh, in the initial years of elementary school. And nowadays, it is, it is almost like Silesian, there is not much difference, but people living there, um, today this area uh, happens to be included in the Czech Republic, uh, call it uh, Pryski Jezik, uh, meaning the Prussian language. Yeah, so. Uh, you see how people make uh, their uh, choices. So, uh, to, to cut the long story short, uh, in the inter, in the uh, prior to the First World War, people uh, were speaking Silesian at home. They were acquiring uh, standard German or Deutsch uh, at school and were using it in the army, in school. In, in state offices, but when it came uh, to church, obviously Latin was the language of liturgy at that time, they were using uh, standard Polish uh, for songs yeah, and for talking uh, uh, to priests. Now fast forward to 45, more or less, uh, I'm leaving out uh, the interwar period, if you are interested I can tell you more about it in detail. I don't wanna, uh, uh, to speak too, too much, we have some time. Okay, so uh, maybe I will go to the interwar period. Uh, interwar period uh, uh, is marked the beginning of it by the tragic end of the 
uh, First World War, which in the case of uh, Upper Silesia meant uh, the contestation of this uh, region by the newly established Polish nation state and by the newly established Czechoslovak nation state. It led uh, to the multiple divisions, but the most important division of the region was between Germany and uh, between Poland. Poland uh, getting most uh, of the industrial base in, in the very east uh, of this region, uh, replacing German as a co-official language uh, within four years of the division of 1922. So in 1926 everything was to be in the Polish and uh, Silesia was not allowed either. Yeah? So, uh, all these local people who were voting for inclusion in Poland were kind of outraged because they were fired en masse from uh, uh, positions uh, to which uh, they had the right by the value of the education in the German educational system. And uh, when it came to the 1930 uh, local elections, all these people were voting for the German parties, which the Warsaw didn't like. Uh, <coughs> uh, basically, after 1935, uh, the suppression of uh, German educational, uh, educational system and the suppression of the regional Silesian language-based uh, organization was uh, complete. Then there is the Second World War, so the situation is kind of reversed. It is the German authorities uh, which uh, uh, were combating the Polish influences, quote unquote. They also turned against uh, the Silesian language, Silesian culture, because the German authorities, out of sudden, uh, start seeing them as an uh, expression of uh, Polish. Uh, Nationalized. Then the end of the Second World War, the Allies in Potsdam grant this area uh, along uh, uh, the Deutsche of Gebiete, the territories uh, east uh, of the Oder Neisse line uh, to Poland. The, the decision is taken that all the Germans are to be expelled, but most of these Germans, quote unquote, were retained, even if they wanted to leave, uh, by the Polish state because they were indispensable for running the industrial basin of Upper Silesia, which was of crucial importance for the reconstruction of post-war Poland. Importantly, in Central Europe, it was the only industrial basin which was not destroyed. So it was quite an asset. Uh, one has to remember that uh, until 1950, this uh, industrial basin was producing uh, from three quarters of uh, Poland's GDP in uh, 1946 uh, to like 50% uh, of Poland's uh, GDP. Yeah. So, so if you had expelled this population, you, you wouldn't have had anyone working there because elsewhere in Poland there was no a pool of population with the same kind of skills to replace these. Yeah. So, in order to make it work, ideologically speaking, in light of the mm, Polish ethno-linguistic nationality, these people were uh, a completely new term was invented for these people. That they were autochtones, you know, that they were from here, that they were indigenous, meaning that they actually were living there before the Germans came. There is such a myth. Yeah. Uh, obviously, uh, it is not more than, 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 than a myth. Uh, uh, since uh, the 14th century, uh, between the 14th century, uh, after the 14th century, uh, all of Silesia belonged to the Holy Roman Empire, not mm. to the Kingdom of Poland, for instance. Yeah, but let's, let's leave this myth uh, aside. What did it mean that these people were autochthons? What, what did it mean in practice? The term meant that these people were in the official ethnic Poles who didn't realize, didn't uh, know yet that they were Poles. Yeah? So we have a very similar policy like nowadays pursued by Russia and Ukraine. Yeah? Well, the Ukrainians are Russians, they don't know it yet. The Russian army, if successful, would make sure that uh, they would define themselves as Russian, not as Ukrainians. Obviously the situation is uh, different uh, 
in this historical period I'm uh, covering in the case of Upper Syria, but the dynamics is uh, very similar. What was the problem? These people were speaking German. And actually during the war it was prohibited to speak uh, uh, Silesian, let alone Polish. And uh, my father remembered uh, this uh, period very uh, distinctly because uh, when the war started he was uh, six, so then he went to school and uh, all his family, in order not to make problems for him, were talking to him only in German. And so 45 counts, the war is over, he speaks only German. Lots, lots of people were speaking only German. And they were prohibited to speak German. And obviously people speak what they speak because they don't have anything else, so they were speaking German. So the authorities as they are, uh, communist and uh, totalitarian, uh, they started introducing a system of punishing uh, uh, linguistic criminals, if I may. And obviously uh, there was the gradation of uh, this punishment, so it was pecuniary fine, uh, it was, you know, uh, uh, firing you from your job if, if you had a job provided by state, taking your agricultural, uh, you know, in, I mean, taking your farm basically uh, if you persist in speaking German, requisitioning your house, your apartment, yeah, not allowing your children to attend school, and if you were a persistent quote unquote linguistic criminal you were thrown into the concentration camp which was maintained in Gleibnitz, Klibice, until 1950. So, people did stop speaking uh, uh, German because it was dangerous and they wanted to survive and they were not allowed uh, to go to Germany even if they wanted. Uh, and uh, the network of spies uh, were all around uh, in order to ensure that they wouldn't uh, speak uh, German. So German as uh, a language of everyday uh, communication disappeared overnight. You know. Like my colleagues, when I was telling them that, uh, that you can liquidate a German, you know, liquidate a, a, the use of a language in a span of a couple of years, they were laughing at me. No, if you have a totalitarian state, totalitarian state can do all kinds of uh, strange uh, uh, things. Obviously, at the beginning, people were kind of silent whenever you had a, a stranger in a, in a village or uh, nearby. They were making their best to speak in Silesian to their children, so at least they could pass, you know, talking quote unquote as Silesian was seen then as a broken Polish or a corrupted Polish. Uh, so children would not talk. Uh, 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 German any longer, and, and, and uh, adult people would acquire a smattering of Polish or Silesian if they had none, and then they would continue uh, talking, uh, uh, you know, in German only to their trusted friends when no one could hear. So the transmission of German as a language. Uh, from one generation to another generation stopped. Obviously, there were several thousand out of the population of one million and a half uh, families which kind of secretly maintained the, the transmission of German. And Adam can, you, uh, can tell you about uh, such families from his own uh, uh, experience. But as a language of community, it disappeared. Yet, as uh, the 2010 sociological uh, uh, research on uh, the German minority uh, carried out uh, by scholars and sociologists from uh, Osaka University kind of showed very clearly through over 500 interviews that over 60% of people uh, as members of the German minority, using everyday life Silesian. Yeah. However, the, the, the authorities the, of the German minority organization, they dislike this result. Although 
Many of them don't speak uh, any good German or no German at all. And, uh, you know, that's the explanation why not. Yeah? So it's not their fault. On the other hand, uh, uh, many officials of the German minority organizations nowadays in Poland, in including the, vice, uh, uh, the German vice consulate in Opole, Open, they are disparaging. Silesian, that, that it is that it isn't any language, that it is a, 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 just a dialect, which is strange, because if these people don't speak uh, German, they can use actually Silesian uh, to emphasize uh, their uh, identity as Germans and uh, use it in a multilingual fashion. Uh, apart from the German minority. Uh, who are speaking Silesian now and they are kind of concentrated in uh, central uh, or mo mostly western part of uh, uh, Upper Silesia. In this industrial zone of Upper Silesia you have people who speak Silesian and identify as Silesians. And there are many more. According to the two last censuses there are 800,000 people. So, uh, from the Polish census, you can see that uh, the, the, the people who identify uh, on the basis of the linguistic identity as Silesians, uh, they are de facto uh, Poland's largest minority uh, today, but the Polish state does not recognize them, and so it is a political uh, choice. Problem I stop here. Yeah. <laughs> If you are interested in hearing mm -hmm. more, I'm happy to, hear, to, to answer your questions. So, thank you very much for this moment. And actually, the first question is my, from my side, the question is to you. Do you have any questions at this moment of this whole introduction part? If not, I might allow myself to ask one question because I got very good. Wait, wait, maybe someone will have a question. Questions. Yep. Uh, yeah. That's so good. in today's Poland, how would I don't want to frame this in I don't want to make it sound negative in any way, but how could the rejuvenation or um, reimplication of um, Silesian be viewed? Is it always in a negative political aspect, or can can it be viewed as a positive cultural? Reheritage or um, a coming back to what this area was? I would hope for the latter, yeah. mm -hmm. but unfortunately, the current government in Poland is populist and nationalist. Mm -hmm. Earlier, the cabinets ruling in Poland were pretty nationalist, not populist, but pretty nationalist, and uh, uh, they, they, they refused to recognize Silesian as a language. Uh, because of the nationalism, because of the fact that they still, that many people still believe, including the authorities in Poland, that language stiffly equates identity. So, if you speak another language, you belong to another nation, and if you belong to another nation, it is sure that you, as a group, would establish a secessionist uh, uh, movement which would try to establish a separate nation state and that would mean the end of Poland. I, I would say that uh, the argument uh, is old fashioned, it shouldn't be followed like this, and in Poland, uh, like elsewhere in, in Europe, uh, multilingual, multilingual uh, Heritage should be cherished and used uh, as uh, an element uh, of developing culture. And actually, at the level of rhetoric, it is being done. Yeah? Because uh, if you look at the promotional materials uh, of the region of Opole and the region of Katowice, which, into which uh, the, the historical region of Upper Silesia is divided, they kind of stress out we are multilingual, we are open, our population knows German, and please invest here. Yeah. So, but, but, but when it comes you know, uh, to uh, uh, some efforts to establish German language schools, uh, until today not a single 
German medium school uh, has been established ever in Upper Silesia after the end of communism. Yet, when you look at uh, the uh, Polish uh, statistical yearbook, it says that uh, in Poland there are around 500 uh, German minority schools. Yeah. So, yeah, everything is fine on paper. Obviously, uh, if, if you are persistent and if you kind of read through this uh, statistical year, you, you find out very soon that uh, uh, German minority school is any school where German is being taught as a minority language. What does it mean, German taught as a minority language? It is a, a language of a minority which is taught at least for two hours per week. It is a kind of a joke, yeah? Because during communist times I was going to a secondary school and I had uh, four hours per week of the English language, so I was going to an English uh, minority school, you could say, on the basis of this definition. So you see, there is the law, there, there are nice definitions, there is a kind of nice propaganda for outside consumption, but the reality is as it is, not a single German language uh, school. So, how, uh, how important is German for the identity of the Silesian minority? Because to me, it seems Silesian is the main language you you speak. Um, why why is German why is German still important for the for the identity of the Silesian minority? May I reply to that? German is not important for the Silesian identity. Silesian is important for the German identity, and Silesian is important for the Silesian identity. So you have to imagine there are two minority groups. Very often, one person can be a person of both minorities, feeling Silesian German, but German is rather important to those who assume to be Germans. Not that often it happens to those who just say that they are just Silesian. Yeah? So basically, but Silesian as the language always support both identities. Mm -hmm. One hand German one, and the other, the other hand the Silesian one. Well, if, if I may continue. Basically, if you have a language, and if you believe it is a marker of identity, it basically depends on a group which, which uses it, meaning how the group will see it as a marker of identity and of wish identity. Yeah. So, nowadays, Upper Silesia Germans speak Silesian, but they don't emphasize it and they are ashamed of it. And they still don't see it as a proper sign of uh, uh, German identity. Then there are Silesian speakers who see it as a marker of their identity and they are proud of it and uh, uh, they uh, use it as the marker of their Silesian identity. And there are obviously Poles who speak uh, Silesian and they believe it is a marker due to propaganda which lasted the, of the communist Poland, that it is a marker of Polish identity and that Silesian is a dialect of Polish. So there is a multiplicity of uses and approaches. Uh, in the case of the German minority, there is this kind of phenomenon which is uh, referred to by Joshua Fishman as schizoglossia, that you are disparaging uh, the, the, the actual use of the language which you speak, you know, which is the worst thing which you can do to yourself. Uh, I would say, because what can you, you are disparaging yourself. Then, there is also a historical reply uh, to, to, to your question about the importance of the German language uh, for these people who speak Silesian and identify as Silesians. Well, uh, they have it in the living memory of the parents, grandparents, the fact that until 1945 in Upper Silesia, people were using uh, different languages in different situations, that was fine. So, why cannot be done like we do it today? Okay. 
My question would refer to the census which you mentioned, because we have the census, the first one, which is, let's say, democratic one, 2,270 people claiming that they're Silesians, a bit more to say that they're Germans, then 10 years later, 2011, 850,000 saying that they're Silesians, so almost a million, um, and 150 only those who said that they're Germans, right? Mm -hmm. Last year, there was the census again. It was a bit strange because of the conditions of the pandemic situation, and we don't have the results for today. So, what do you think? How will the outcome be of the census from last year? The numbers, will they increase or decline? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. I basically don't know, I cannot answer it, but I, uh, I have problems to trust the Polish authorities uh, which are governing the country now. Yeah. Because in, in a democratic country uh, you trust the authorities when it comes to censuses, elections, but nowadays the authorities which govern the country can basically influence the situation but not releasing the real numbers but massaging them as they want. Yeah. Uh, you know, like like uh, in the saying attributed to Stalin, those win elections who count the votes. <laughs> and uh, we have actually such a, a situation, all the elections which were held in Poland after uh, 2015, they appear to be fair, meaning they have not been falsified, but they are un unequal when it comes uh, to, uh, to the chances of the opposition party to show their views and programs in the state mass media. And the sta state mass media are kind of tweaked in favor of the ruling pro-authoritarian party, and when it comes to uh, the census, you could see it that it was very difficult to choose Silesian nationality on the census. It was kind of the possibility was kind of hidden in in, in a sub menu. Yeah? So uh, even through this technical device, I believe many people didn't declare their Silesian identity yet even when they were able relatively freely to declare the Silesian nationality in the 2011 census, the state authorities, which were not under this pro-authoritarian regime yet, basically decided to disregard the results. Yeah? When, when, when it came to the uh, formal interpretation of the results, they didn't say that the Silesians are the largest minority in Poland. They, said, they, they basically said that they are just a regional group of ethnic Poles. And those people who declared the Silesian identity, they don't know what they are declaring. So why to ask? Um, so, uh, after the Second World War, uh, ethnic Silesians were being declared as indigenous people, but within that number, um, so, Silesians have been here since the Middle Ages, but they, uh, so, once Silesia belonged to uh, the, Holy, the Holy Roman Empire, or afterwards the Habsburg dynasty, and then Grand Duchy of Poland, or whatever, were also ethnic Germans sent to Silesia, like ethnic Germans were sent to Transylvania, to the Danube Valley in Serbia. Uh, so, of course, the Silesians were brought up in German because of the, uh, because of the, of the German uh, rule at the time. But yeah, were there any ethnic German settlements who were brought up from uh, the, the Prussian ruling powers of Austria? Well, you know, I could go on and, to, and, and, and uh, talk about it, how the, the, the patterns of settlement changed, but uh, uh, it is going for the discourse in the line of uh, um, nationalist mythology proposing that nations existed forever for a long time. Yeah? Uh, uh, actually, those guys 
who were coming eastward uh, and nowadays are referred to as Germans, they refer to themselves as Saxons, as, as Swabians. <laughs> and and uh, the fact, uh, 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 the most important fact of the identity wasn't actually language or where they were coming from at the time, but actually a state. Yeah? If they were noblemen or if they were not noblemen. So uh, I, I would say when it comes to historical period, we can discuss it, but we need to discuss it kind of differently. Uh, in, in the terms of identity which were used at that time. Mm -hmm. and until basically uh, 1848 revolutions, uh, the, the, the fact which language you spoke or was less important uh, than basically to which state you belong and which religion you profess. Yes. So, uh, this would be... Uh, I would need to use these terms to explain uh, the changes in the identity and I, I guess I won't have time to do it now. If you are really interested, my first book was about it, so you can have a look at it. Oh, sure. uh, Silesia and Central European Nationalism. The changes happening in 1848 in the region of uh, 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 Central Europe when nationalism in this ethno-linguistic type mm -hmm. starts spreading among the population irrespective of its states, and yes. actually is replacing uh, its, its states. So, uh, 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 but, but you know, it, it was kind of a prolonged process and it lasted from the middle of the 19th century until the middle of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So the emergence of Silesians as self-aware ethnic group, it is like the first half of the 20th uh, century, I, see. I, 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 I would say. So you mean that... And, uh, and, oh, uh, uh, when, when the Polish authori communist authorities declared the population as autochton in Upper Silesia, they declared all the population. Okay? Yeah. Because the effort was uh, to justify why these were not expelled like, like the other Germans. Yeah, was solely based on economic purposes. Well, uh, de facto, but officially it was based on the ethno-linguistic yeah. uh, 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 principle because the propaganda was claiming that these people were ethnic Poles, even if they didn't realize it. So how did the authorities know that, uh, uh, that they were ethnic Poles? They were ethnic Poles because they had some Slavic surnames, because uh, they were speaking Silesian, uh, apart from excellent German, yeah? or, and that's it, you know. Uh, although, although, when you had an autochton who was speaking excellent Polish because uh, prior to uh, the Second World War went to a German minor uh, to a Polish minority school. His parents or her parents made such a choice, and such a Pole, uh, self-declared Upper Silesian Pole, survived the Second World War and had a nice uh, uh, farm, uh, well maintained. And when a communist guy came and liked this farm, he was declared a German. Well, it didn't matter whatever he said, he was kind of expelled to German farm. Uh, so you mean that in the case, for instance, of uh, the poet Josef von Eichendorf, who was born in Silesia um, and who was uh, one of the main poets of German rom Romanticism at the beginning of the 19th century, because he was brought up in the area before the 1848 revolution and because he was of aristocratic ancestry, he of course identified as a German and then was brought up in Germany, but it wasn't due to an ethnic sense of belonging, but rather because he belonged to the aristocracy. And you see, Eichendorf came of age before the Napoleonic Wars, yeah? Yeah. So earlier he was uh, identifying as a member of uh, uh, the state of nobility. Yeah, the ruling class. And, 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 uh, and uh, he and his family uh, had uh, also uh, long-lasting uh, 
loyalty to the emperor and, mm -hmm. to, and then to the Austrian emperor because uh, they land, the land, the logic was, the, econ the economic and political logic was such that the lands were kind of divided between, after uh, 1740s, between uh, Prussia and in Upper Silesia and uh, between the Austrian Empire, the Habsburg land. And uh, probably his most important identity was uh, his Catholicism. Yeah. And then, because of the Napoleonic Wars, the rise of this uh, ethno-linguistic uh, uh, German national movement, uh, he's kind of switching uh, to, to this German identity. But obviously, uh, if you go to sources, he was uh, speaking uh, to the local population, meaning his peasants, yeah, because yeah, yeah. they were Serbs. Yeah, yeah. And, and he was the owner in the local language in yeah. order to communicate. And uh -huh. uh, nowadays, you would refer to this uh, language as Prussian or Moravian, yeah, because it was uh, uh, within the boundaries of this all means, all modes. Uh, Archdiocese. That's why I'm always saying, go for the sources. Don't yeah. believe in the national myths which are proposed to be uh, the history. It is not the history. These are myths. It's, uh, in order not to uh, uh, commit an error of anachronies, you have uh, to analyze the past in the terms uh, of uh, the past. And uh, just to give you a clear example, you know, like many people speak about the Weimar Republic. Yeah? And obviously the Weimar Republic, uh, the name of, I, I was in the museum of, uh, of uh, Friedrich Ebert, that's why it kind of struck me. Uh, and, and, and obviously uh, in, 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 during the time of the Weimar Republic, the name of the country was Deutsches Reich, the German Empire. Yeah. And during the Third Reich, it was also the Deutsches Reich. Yeah? And actually, the label of uh, the, the scholarly label of Weimar Republic was only developed in the 1960s. But now, in uh, uh, German history textbooks, uh, the period between 1918-1933 is uh, referred to as the Weimar Republic. Yeah? But when the students go to the sources, they will not find a single document with its name. So that's how anachronistic approach to uh, history is sometimes produced, in this case, with good intentions. Yeah? I'm just pointing out it was uh, uh, a democratic period in the history of uh, Germany, but still anachronistic, which is wrong according to me as a historian. If I might allow myself to bring the topic back to the current situation, I would like to ask you about the current trends. How do you see the Silesian culture, the German culture in Silesia today, as of today, language, culture, because um, it was it lasted through centuries, Silesian as the Slavic, West Slavic language, mm -hmm. but then the um, codification started in the 20th century with Steuer firstly, and then uh, 10 years ago, or even longer, like 12 years ago, we had the first alphabet called Slavikos. So basically, the alphabet has been introduced to the population like 10 years ago. This is the most um, um, known one and used by authors like Stefan Tvardov of today. Um, how do you see, I mean, the strength, the power? Do you see that it will survive? I mean, will it support the uh, further development of the language and culture? Or is it actually a bit too late because people are refusing to use the language because of the nationalistic trends? Or how do you see You're talking about Silesian yeah, or German or both? Both. Well, mm -hmm. so when it comes to German, basically during the 30 years, the great <coughs> chance of uh, reviving the transmission, intergenerational transmission of German was lost. Yeah. Because neither the German uh, minority authorities nor the German government were taking care of it. And uh, the money which could have been spent on it was spent on something else. So I would say it's a series uh, of uh, bad uh, de decisions, uh, which stands, for, in for instance, in contrast uh, to what happened to the Polish minority in Lithuania, which is more or less of the same size, uh, and until today they have uh, around 100 uh, Polish uh, medium uh, schools. Uh, 
uh, when it comes, I mean, there are no writers in German in uh, Upper Silesia. There is no self uh, repro self reproducing uh, cultural production in this language because there are no people speaking it. There is some consumption for sure because there are, I don't know, 20,000, 15,000 people who have passive knowledge of German or work in, in, in companies uh, doing some stuff in German and uh, read uh, German uh, books. Uh, and quite a lot of the population, especially since the 90s, they watch German language cartoons when they are kids, so they have some kind of exposure to German, but, but this exposure is not built on, and when it's built on, practically the family is leaving for Germany and rarely returning uh, to uh, Upper Silesia. Or, or uh, when the, the industrialization of Upper Silesia happened in the middle of the 90s, a lot of males lost uh, upper, uh, upper Silesian males lost their jobs in, uh, mine, in the mines and the metallurgical uh, companies. So uh, they, because uh, of Article 116 of the Grundbesetz, uh, could get the German citizenship, they got the German citizenship, and they started work in Germany, but seasonally, yeah? so kind of shuttling between German and Upper Silesia. So they acquired German, but uh, they acquired German as a language of the, of the work and it is not uh, transmitted to the children or, or, or the families. Yeah? So German functions there, but, but uh, not in a straightforward manner as uh, we know it here in, in uh, Germany. May I interrupt or ask something? Because you said there is no active knowledge. Would you say it's not used or there is in general no, no active ability of using the language? I mean, not active to such a level that, uh, you know, a group of writers, a self-reproducing group of writers, editors, uh, would appear. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, like uh, the editor of this uh, minority newspaper, Wochenblatt, uh, was kind of a German from Germany. Who had At the beginning. But uh, and, and, and Knobloch? Yeah, but now you've got people from there. So, yeah, but how many? These are few. Yeah? yeah, but how many people do you need to have to have an actual scene for writers and editors? I, I have no clue. You see, uh, no, no one will give you the formula how many you, you would have. But I, I, I would say, I would say, a good litmus test is to have, you know, some localities, some villages where. Uh, the, the, the target language would be the language of, of everyday, uh, everyday uh, sure. communication. Yeah. That's, true, but that, that's why Silesian uh, has a better chance because it's still uh, a language of everyday education. And there are some writers out of some yeah. without any support yeah, of the state, yeah. right? including yourself. Yeah, but <laughs> now the question, including myself, also to the first topic, which is German and only Silesian, is. Um, wouldn't you say that it's a situation where because of the nationalistic movements, which hasn't stopped actually from, uh, after the communist period, that it's still not a good scene when a person go, goes through the city and speaks German one to another? Would you say that there is the ability, but you have to bring with you a German-speaking person who is not able to understand any Slavic, and then all of a sudden those people actively use German? Because uh, from my perspective, I, um, with that book, actually have the experience that people actually came to the readings, mm -hmm. started to use German, asked questions in German, and very often they don't belong to the structures of the German minority, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, you know, as I, mean, I, as I said, uh, due, due, due to the functioning of the, uh, of the German language in all these kind of manners which I try to describe, the, 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 there is a group of people who enjoy how much, how many people, because you said there was the research 2010 know. from Japan, right? Yeah. But uh, the results are not really known, because they have been, I mean, I don't know about the results. Uh, the, the German minority, this uh, house of the German-Polish yeah. cooperation, they published this kind of book. Do you remember how many speakers of German it were, 
were listed in there? Because few, usually people, few, few it's like few. people say that it's a minority within the minority which is able uh, to speak the language. But, but you know, the, that's an interesting question, yeah? Because when it comes to, because some people are asking, how come that uh, in 1990, 350,000 people declared uh, German nationality and nowadays you have 150. What happened to these people? Yeah? And, uh, and these people basically fear to uh, say openly that they are Germans. And I would say a better indicator how many Germans do you have in Poland is the fact of acquiring German passport. In today's Poland, according to the, uh, to, 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 to the German statistics of this passport issued uh, uh, to, 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 to ethnic Germans in Poland, the statistic of five years ago, there are 250,000 people. So actually the number didn't drop. Yeah. They, are, they are still there. Yeah, what I've heard of but, is that the number is increasing because of the current situation, to be honest. Yeah, maybe. But I'm talking about the data which I know, yeah, because I don't live there, so I, I, I cannot say I, I left Upper Silesia you know, like permanently like 12, over 20 years ago. So when you take statistics and censuses, you, 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 have, you have a strange uh, disjoint, yeah? Like 150,000 people. Uh, uh, declare uh, 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 German nationality and 150,000 people declare the use of German as the language of everyday education. Yeah? And these two groups do not overlap. Mm -hmm. yeah? So I would say, and obviously we know that people don't use German as the language of everyday education. So it is declarative. Uh, so it is just, uh, how to say it, the declaration of the youth which is not happening. So it is symbolic declaration, yeah? uh, which is instead of something. I would say those people who fear to declare their nationality as German, but they safely have you know, German passport at home, uh, they instead declare German language in, uh, and Polish nationality, so it is kind of a game. It shows that the population does not trust the state, and rightly so. Yeah. I, 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 I was talking to you know like 20 years ago to to, to uh, uh, people of the generation of my father. Oh, now now you can speak German. Don't worry. Do something. Oops. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> you would say the Polish security forces. Let's hope not, but you never know. <laughs> okay, but 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 what they feared, yeah, and they told me, well, uh, don't trust the situation. Yes, and you know what? <laughs> they turned out, unfortunately, to be right after 2016. Because after 2016, this anti-German rhetoric, I suppose it's a few, they kind of came back. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but we are in the, in the historical center of, of Heidelberg, in the old town. So we have nothing changed since, since yeah. the end of the Middle Ages, so it's no <laughs> <laughs> We haven't spoken actually or mentioned, when it comes just to the German part, that there are certain people, young people, in the age of 20, 30, which are born in the late 80s, 90s, 2000s, who actually learned the language because of the grandparents, because of the television, as you mentioned, and the family members living in Germany. For example, I belong to those people who actually came to Germany with the knowledge of German coming from Upper Silesia, but it was never, as you said, actively used in the region, uh, just in the moments where the family members came and visited because there was no approach, or maybe just in those moments when we were alone with the grandparents, right? Because the parents did not speak the language. So it was obvious that there is no sense in using a language with the parents are not able, capable of understanding. But I would say that there is a certain population right now which is actively able to use it, and I'm testing that. Uh, to be honest, I'm surprised how often it happens that either they speak it very naturally, let's say naturally, like in the mode of they have been raised with the language or uh, they learned the language because they uh, regain the meaning of the language. But 
What about the Silesian language? Because we've got the, let's say, three or four uh, editing houses, or publishing houses, which are uh, producing books like uh, the very famous one, Silesia Progress, right? Mm -hmm. Would you say, I mean, the f very famous one, but when, when we think about Silesian writing and publishing literature in it, with, uh, and not referring to Stefan Tvar, but who's obviously publishing in Krakow, um, but to the local uh, writers who start, produce tax in Silesia, this publishing house is known in the area of Upper Silesia. Would you say it's a good... Um, how is the trend? What, how would you describe the future, or what is your yeah, tendency? How do you see that? Okay, so when it comes just to side starting issue. from this, yeah. uh, you know, you, you allowed to have a question to your first remark. Uh, obviously, it is surprising to me that private entrepreneurs kind of took up the challenge and made it uh, into uh, the economically profitable businesses. Yeah. It, 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 so it shows that however li little demand it is there, it can be translated into some economic success. And however strong the opposition and the suppression of the state, uh, by the state uh, of the Syrian language and culture is there, it, 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 it is still happening. Uh, I, I would say there is only one uh, re reasonable publisher uh, of Silesian language publications. The others are either small or kind of collapsed, so there are problems. Uh, I, I would say it is fair to compare it with the situation of the Sorbs in Germany. Yeah? They, are, they all, all also have just one serious publisher, Domovina, and uh, they are financed by the state. Yeah? So, going by this uh, yardstick, uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful, yet, yet, because there is no formal support by the state, there, there is no agreement of the state that uh, some kind of private or uh, associations can be uh, established and supported uh, as a minority language. We, we can imagine such a situation that uh, the director and owner of Silesia Progress, something happens to him, let alone he dies, that's it, yeah. it's gone. Yeah. So, would you say it's not a cultural trend where people would accept and then probably somebody else would continue or reopen a new publishing yeah. house? Because one thing, what I wanted to add to this is in Katowice, in Katowice you see pro the new buildings which have been built like five years ago with writings in Silesian. Uh, which are supporting the workers in the banks and the offices there, like Velishna a Luft Asetichni, which is basically some of the words are German Luft, and other ones are more Silesian, basically. But it appears in the public sphere, you've got always also advertisements uh, in this area, not, not, for example, not close to Apollo, but uh, rather in the area of Katowice. Um, from companies like Coca-Cola and the other ones, yeah. or even the mobile phones applications yeah. are produced right now with the apps in Silesian. So, wouldn't you say that this trend is bringing the language ability of being used in not only private situations but also in the business sphere or, let's say, in an upper? Mm -hmm. Yes and no, because in a way it 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 makes it up. Uh, acceptable to the users to see the uh, previously exclusively spoken language uh, written and displayed in signage in public spaces and it also makes it more acceptable in this form to uh, non silesians yet it doesn't translate into uh, formal literacy in the silesian language because it's not taught at school yeah? So people need to make an effort on their own to get to know uh, they, they, uh, to get to know the writing system of this language, and, and they need to make an effort on their own and start reading uh, uh, the books, and they do, and especially they do in the case of uh, uh, children's books. Yeah. Children's books are a big bestseller, like the translations of uh, Astrid Lindgren or 
Mumins, Tove Janssons, Children's Books, or by Lewis Carroll, which shows that Silesia is really actively used as intimate language, as the language of intimacy between parents and children. Will it translate in the future into a language of literacy among young adults and adults? Maybe. I hope yes. Yeah. <laughs> but will it happen? Who knows? Just to give you a cautionary tale. You know German because your grandmother was talking to you in German then some family members uh, were coming from Germany to visit you and they were talking in German. Then you had the chance to go to Germany and so on and so on. And the media at home. I I I, and there, there were media, the satellite TV, uh, VHS. I, I, I had a very similar beginning in my own family. My own mom, my grandmother was talking to me in German. Fine. But then uh, it was in the communist times, we are talking in the middle of the 70s. Uh, she died and uh, uh, my parents didn't speak at home German, although my, my father knew German. Uh, uh, my family members were not allowed to come to communist Poland and we were not allowed to go to capitalist West Germany. And I didn't have a chance. Uh, to study at a German language university. Uh, my life uh, you know, kind of developed as it developed and then I ended up at an English speaking university. But probably if there had been no communists, if or if communists had collapsed earlier, I could have been very well in the same shoes as you are now. <laughs> probably yes, probably yes. But wouldn't you say that there are methods and options of gaining the ability of using the language today as an adult person, not um, acquiring the language later on as a foreign language, let's say? Because me, as a person who is teaching the language abroad, not, even, not only in Germany, but also in Poland and in America, I saw that it depends on the motivation. So basically, I would say when the motivation of the people would be strong enough and there would be a certain attachment to the identity and awareness that using the methods which are given by Deutsche Welle and other online uh, platforms um, to re-establish the position of German wouldn't be an issue if the political situation would be not as nationalistic as it is at the moment. Yes and no. For individuals, yes. For the community, no, because uh, re-establishing intergenerational uh, transmission of a community language, you would need the educational system. Yeah? There would, you, you would need to have, you know, for 150,000 self-declared uh, Germans, uh, around 100 uh, uh, German medium schools uh, of uh, all kinds, including a German university. But it is not there. Yeah? So it won't be happening. And because acquiring knowledge of a language as. Uh, yeah. yeah, Oli, could you please contact maybe Clement and ask him if there is these. Also, sicher, 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 right. <laughs> that would be probably the short <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. By, by acquiring a language, you actually mean acquiring literacy in this language. And acquiring literacy is a business which takes a lot of effort and uh, usually a person doesn't uh, acquire a literacy in more than two languages, very rarely three, because it's time consuming. Uh, yeah, but then you acquire certain knowledge which is, as in my opinion, I would call that German as a minority language. For example, Paul, who's correcting lots of my texts, mm -hmm. always says there are certain struggles in your constructions of the language, which is the fact that yeah. because I haven't been educated in that language for many years, so the same happens when I would, if I would write in Polish, but the chance of Silesian is whatever you write, and whatever, whenever a person comes to you and say, but that is wrong, say, how come? 
you know, you can reply, this is right for me. So I would say the chance of using Silesian in the written form as the people of the first hour, of the first uh, decade of mm -hmm. using the language in the written form, you can basically do, what, do whatever you want, as long as this is a certain um, yeah, uh, argument behind that, which will mm -hmm. say why you did that. You, you, are, you are talking about uh, a bit of, uh, of a different thing here, yeah? because Silesian is present strongly in uh, uh, in the region as the language of the sure, Because I noticed that many times when I use something which I've heard in yeah. Texas, right? Yeah. People are like shocked. What is that? And, and it appears they understand after the context comes. I understand what you are mm -hmm. saying, but it is the language of everyday communication. So obviously, you are not discussing politics in it, or you are not, not discussing, I don't know, uh, linguistics in it. Maybe. We do. <laughs> well, I mean, at least I do. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I'm talking about the average user now. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, standardization is always arbitrary. Yeah? There are certain choices, and standardization of a language can be done, quote unquote, the French and the German way. Yeah, Professor X says so. Uh, then Minister X uh, uh, kind of approves it with a stamp, then it goes to school, and everyone has to do it like that. Uh, then you have this kind of uh, Anglo-American approach, people do as they want, the majority of the people using uh, certain construction, certain pronunciation, wins it uh, for the standard. And I guess, you know, without uh, the educational system, with teaching uh, Silesian whatsoever, uh, it is the publishers, and it is the, the readers who are voting uh, with their choices uh, for this or for that uh, uh, solution. And as you proved with your book, uh, which is written actually in the form of Silesian used by the German minority, in which uh, more German language, uh, uh, long words and syntactical uh, constructions are available, the market is there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a question, or even two questions coming uh, out of three. I have a question because well, let's start here from the left. For me, it's new. Everything is new. Uh, Adam is the only solution that I, uh, I know. The very first one, and uh, the only one. There are 800,000 more. <laughs> so, <laughs> so beware. <laughs> maybe you didn't even know that the other ones are called spin or Perhaps, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Uh, well, I didn't even know that Silesian was a Slavic language. I thought it was German, a sort of German. Uh, so, uh, I learned tonight very much. What surprises me is that in, oh, in Greece, uh, in 400 years uh, of Turk domination, the Greek language survived because of the Orthodox Church. So, uh, if today we have a Greek language, modern Greek, it's because for 400 years people continued to speak a, a language became mixed with Church words, uh, words, but it was, it is still a Greek language. So, uh, and um, I think I know a, a lady from uh, Transylvania, from uh, today's mm -hmm. Romania, that mm -hmm. uh, her town is Hermannstadt. No, uh, and she went under Charles Eswick, under Charles Eswick, she went to German school, and she uh, had the German culture. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it surprises me then in uh, Slesia, uh, in a very short time, mm -hmm. Uh, you lost language, and uh, the, the discussion tonight is uh, how many people do uh, declare themselves as Silesian, as German. It's a declaration, but it's not actually an identity. Uh, for me, it sounds like, I don't know if it's uh, like this, but it sounds like that the Silesian identity doesn't really... Uh, Can touch to your... It's, it's not very touchable, it's not very concrete. Because it, if it were concrete, it, it would have survived. I mean, 40 years, 50 years is not a very long time. If uh, the Greeks have spoken Greek for 400 years, and uh, if under Charles Eskimo, which was not a very 
liberal person, uh, in, they could have German schools and they could speak German, they could develop their, their culture. How is it possible that in Poland, uh, this identity, this uh, language, this culture, just disappeared as more or less something that you want to uh, renew now, but it's gone lost. It seems to me, I don't know if, I, if I'm right, but uh, here in you, 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 you've been asking plenty of questions. Because I know nothing. One by one. <laughs> uh, Ceausescu didn't support and didn't open uh, German medium schools. Basically, uh, uh, you have to remember that Romania was a German ally during the war. And uh, uh, the Soviet Union was using ethno-linguistic uh, nationalism as a form of reward or a form of punishment for the Soviet bloc countries. Yeah. So those who were supporting the Soviet Union during the war or started supporting earlier than others were rewarded with the possibility of good ethnic cleansing of the population so the population would become ethno-linguistically homogeneous, like in Poland. So no schools whatsoever for uh, the German minority and no recognition for a German minority. Uh, uh, Romania switched sides from German into the Soviet Union, was it what, like September 44? So not only they had to have these schools, uh, Stalin also imposed the uh, Soviet style uh, uh, autonomous republic for the Hungarians. Yeah. And only later on, uh, Romania becoming a good totalitarian state, uh, the Soviet Union allowed them to liquidate uh, this uh, uh, region. Yeah. Now, well, if, if, if you say, I mean, you are, you are saying that this identity is, uh, you mean probably German identity in Upper Silesia is not very uh, uh, tangible. You could say so if you believe that only language uh, is the marker, the quote-unquote true marker of identity. You will, but Matt, yeah. that's something you will hear German Schlager. You will hear on the fast uh, events, you know, like in the villages, the same songs as in the villages of yeah German villages which are not upper class culture, but then, you know, and, yeah, I don't want to give any examples, but this is very common to hear the same songs here and there. Um, and what is missing is actually what you said, the active usage of the language. So for your ears used to German environment, you will be surprised to see probably sometimes a German flag, sorry, sometimes Bayern München or Borussia Dortmund, um, and sometimes something pretending or, or yeah, saying that this is the German minority, but you will never hear it actively. But then you have to actually approach those people who you know are able to speak the language. And maybe then you're going to have a different uh, experience. Uh, my question, I could um, ask Paul or Simon, who actually have been there, what was their impression of the language or the culture? Was it vividly alive or not really? I mean, was it lit? Was it touchable? Was it not touchable? Because they accompanied me, so I, I was always going to those people where I know we can talk German. Uh, I did not go to those who were not capable of doing that. So, you know what I try to say? It is hidden. And it's hidden like because people are multilingual. They speak Silesian, they speak Polish, and they speak very often those who I know German. So, when you would go with me to Silesia, you would probably have the. Um, impression, okay, the public sphere is Polish-speaking or Slavic-speaking, and then certain people are able to answer and have a conversation with you in German. Uh, this is the untouchable, I would say, German identity. The Silesian one is a bit different because it survives through centuries, through ages, and even in, though it has been uh, suppressed by saying, oh, it's just a broken Polish, it is still alive and used by 500,000 uh, people. And as I mentioned, it appears in the public sphere, the Katowice. So in this area there, it is a 
but like it belongs to the area, which is not the case in Opel. Uh, last year, when Stefan Fadok, that's one of the Polish-speaking writers who claims to be Silesian, not Polish, um, been on a book presentation that asked him publicly three questions in Silesian, he replied in Silesian, people came to me and asked me if I'm from the bo uh, Czech border. Because for the Polish people, for Poland, it was a, a new thing, even though they live in the co co core of the region, which is the capital of Silesia, Opel. And they were surprised, why are you from? Because you speak something we do not really understand. And I said, just 30 kilometers away, <laughs> this is my hometown, which is far away from, I mean, far, 60 kilometers from the Czech border. And I just speak the same thing as people in my area do. So then you see that basically, whenever you approach a Polish population, you switch into Polish, uh, they never, I would say they, the Polish population never or rarely switch into Silesian. And then the same happens with the German language. You know where to go to speak it, or um, you're looking for the places, but it's also not really there, because as you said, there's no university in German, there's no school in German, only private people would use the language. I know a couple of families where the parents actually provided the language to the kids, and I actually last year played chess with a, guy, with a boy who was seven years old, and we did that in German. So it was fantastic. I knew that he's able of, spe able of speaking Polish and Silesian, but I prefer to stay in Silesian. And so, I mean, to stay in German, right? And it's the matter of in which language do you approach the person, in which language, if you know that he or she is trilingual, and if you start with German, you keep talking in German, people will respond to you in German. Um, but it's only happening if you're stubborn, and the stubbornness is missing. I mean, <laughs> people are not used it's to... It's very complicated. It <laughs> is, it is. And I try to keep it simple, but sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, it's not so complicated. You say that German is in Upper Silesia is not tangible. It is tangible. People have German passports, they have German family in Germany. And once again, once again, it is not only language which is important, because if you would believe that only language is important, then the Americans, the Kenyans, the Nigerians, they wouldn't exist. Yeah? Because their identity is purely uh, executed through citizenship and statehood. And in some cases, and as in the case uh, of uh, uh, Greeks, uh, it is uh, religion, yeah? uh, which was uh, used uh, for identification, not language. And anyway, in the Ottoman Empire, there was no effort to liquidate a language. Actually, the 19th century uh, Greek uh, uh, nationalists were proposing that all the Orthodox population from the river of Prut, which is today the river between Moldova and Ukraine, down to Alexandria, are Greek because they are Orthodox. Yeah? So religion uh, in the Balkans was much more often uh, used for identifying the boundaries of the nation than language. Language is a pretty recent thing for this purpose uh, in uh, uh, the Balkans. And actually, religion was very important in uh, Upper Silesia. I remember when I went to my uh, elementary school, my grandmother was still alive and I came back home in a because elementary education in Poland uh, at the time was uh, going for this Polish national master narrative. I was coming home and was pestering her, uh, you know, like, granny, granny, uh, who are you, a Pole or a German? And uh, she was cynic. Najważniejsze być dobry człowiek, a katolik jest katoliczka. So it's most important to be a good man and uh, we are Catholic, that's it. And there is, a, a, there, 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 there is a pretty good book recently, like 10 years ago, published in German, uh, sorry, in English, in English uh, by, by James Bjork, actually an American researcher, uh, who went to the church archives in Upper Silesia to find out how priests were dealing with this uh, question of language and so on. And 
The title of the book, which is the conclusion of the book, is pretty uh, telling. Neither German nor Pole, but Catholic. And, and that, I mean, that reflects the fact that national identity was complicated in this area, and the nationalities just pop up in the late, uh, the last 20, 30 years because as they resist, I mean, I wouldn't say, I don't know how to call that, but since the Polish state is not supporting it properly, people started to understand that they need to claim their identity as a national one, even though it is hard to say that it's a nation, right? So basically, the description, the inter description for Silesia is not even Silesian, or it is, but then the more often one used is which is in our language. So this term in our language in Silesia is a description for the language itself, and that was it. You could ident identify the, the person, like, does he or she speak Ponashimu? Does he or she speak in our language? If so, probably our person. If not, probably not our person, but still Waco, right? Because it's, it was a mixture of cultures. So, the concept of identity as a national one is a bit complicated in Upper Silesia till today, or even even more than today. If I'm gonna, I ask the last or one of the questions because no, there was some questions. Okay, here. sorry. I uh, just had one question, namely, so considering both Romania and Poland were were satellite states and were authoritarian satellite Soviet states, what made it so that? Um, despite the Romanian language policy, which you uh, briefly described, what made it so that uh, the German-speaking population of the so-called former Siebenbergen, Timisoara aside, who got magyarized at the beginning of the 20th century, once uh, Hungary was given more autonomy, um, so Timisoara aside, what made it so that the people in other cities like Brazov, Zegeshoara, or the CPU, uh, a minority of them kept on speaking openly speaking German, whereas uh, they got decimated, at least uh, in the public sphere in, uh, in Upper Silesia. Because the Soviet Union was using nationalities policy as an instrument of doing politics, yeah. punishing countries, punishing peoples. Uh, if, if you look, for instance, uh, at the case. Uh, uh, of uh, uh, the Polish uh, minority in Belarus and Lithuania. Uh, in, 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 in Belarus was kind of trusted Soviet-style republic, so until the fall of communists, the Polish minority there were not given uh, uh, schools with uh, uh, Polish as the medium of education. Lithuanians were seen as an untrustworthy people who had to be deported to Siberia and in order to make uh, the gift, uh, quote-unquote, uh, by Stalin, uh, made by Stalin of Vilnius uh, to uh, Lithuania in 1939, uh, a poisonous gift, uh, uh, the Stalin actually ordered uh, the creation of the Polish medium language education. So you see, Stalin was playing it. Another example, like Bulgaria. Bulgaria actually switched uh, sides uh, from uh, Nazi Germany to the Soviet Union after Romania. Yeah? So Bul Bulgaria was quote-unquote punished uh, with uh, uh, the Soviet Union ordering the country to establish educational uh, mm, uh, minority language educational systems for all kinds of minorities Bulgarians uh, uh, kind of hated and wanted to eradicate them including uh, the Macedonians yeah? uh, but for instance uh, there was a rift uh, disagreement between uh, uh, Tito, the leader of Yugoslavia where the Republic of Macedonia was placed at that time, and, and then started the, the rift between Tito and Stalin, and Stalin said, okay, you Bulgarians can liquidate this uh, educational, minority educational system uh, for Macedonians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the Soviet Union developed in the interwar period this idea that language 
the system of using language as the measure of identity which was signed down in your internal passport and you couldn't uh, uh, change it and when uh, you were uh, uh, offspring of uh, uh, parents of different nationalities you needed to choose just one uh, when you were 16 and then you were not able uh, to change it and then it was used for all kind of repressions yeah especially if you were uh, according to your passport uh, uh, a member of quote unquote enemy nation I guess that was another question from me. Is it still on our... No? Uh, it's, it's not on this same path. It was going back to the language reformation that we were getting to, but um, that's a little too much of a diversion. I can go out and wait. Flying away. <laughs> okay. The Silesian and the Silesian language. Then, if... I, I, I might... A lot, I mean, I would ask another question, which is... Bringing the topic back to the current situation, actually these things which happened in 2020 in Strasbourg where uh, Lukasz Kohut started to speak Silesian in the parliament and the Polish interpreter actually gave up on uh, translating whatever he said because he was not capable of doing that. But on the other hand, the person uh, leading this um, gathering was from Slovakia, I guess. And he was able to understand what the message was, which was a media sensation in Poland even. Um, Łukasz Kowal was asked uh, to make a conference in the parliament in Strasbourg, I guess it was in January, 20th of January this year, 2022, where he invited Stefan Twardow, Professor Mishliwiec from the Saïdjian University, Adam Bodnar as the uh, minority uh, rights ombudsman, yeah. And they actually introduced the topic of what is Silesian language and identity to the broader spectrum of the uh, public uh, discussion in the European Union. Um, on the other hand, we have Szepan Twardo, who is writing and declaring himself to be not Polish but Silesian and winning prizes international wise when it comes to literature. And then we have, yeah, these small interpreters like, uh, interpreters like Peter Bugos, who is not, even, not only declaring himself as being uh, um, the lead of the party of Silesian people, but also having or being the owner of the publishing house Silesian Progress. How would you, and, he, and he speaks German. And he speaks German because he studied German, <laughs> and this is the reason why he's my publisher, that's true. But the question is, how would you say can Poland... Oh, and another information. Mm -hmm. Lukasz Kohut actually did his resolution on Poland in the European Parliament to finally accept Silesian identity and language. Would you say... How, or the question is, how much longer is Poland able to keep that policy on Silesian while, on the other hand, accepting Kashubian's language and identity, which happened mm -hmm. 17 years ago, because the last argument of the Polish government from last year, 2021, was we cannot accept Silesian as a regional language because then we would have to accept other Polish dialects as regional languages, which, as a conclusion, we could say Polish people would stop using Polish. Oh, that, was, that was one of the oh, arguments oh, provided oh, by... Obviously, it's an argument at absurdum, yeah. yeah. Because so how, uh, how long is uh, the government yeah. able to keep this policy of ignoring a large group of uh, minority, culture, language? Let's put it like this. This government is semi-authoritarian, yeah? which, uh, which nowadays rules Poland. And they are also kind of wedded to, to ethno-linguistic nationalism. And before this government, which came to power in 2015, liberal democratic government also followed this policy. So, uh, truly speaking, the, 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 there is nothing in the structures, institutional structures, be it of the European Union or the Council of Europe, uh, to compel Poland to recognize the 
Silesians. So it is the Silesians themselves who can bring about the changes. Mr. Kohut is doing pretty rightly so, shaming Poland at the international level. But some uh, states are impervious to shaming, uh, unfortunately, uh, because I believe, you know, citizens, loyal citizens of a country living there, paying taxes, they have the right to the culture, yeah? uh, why not? Uh, but I can point to uh, the country which is seen as paragon of democracy, meaning France. France is not recognizing any minorities, yeah? uh, any uh, uh, national minority languages, and only recently, after, after almost centuries of uh, grassroots efforts, they started recognizing not German, but Alsatian. They started uh, recognizing yeah, uh, Britonian uh, language, uh, Basque language, you know, at some low-key level, but it is done through this uh, not central uh, legislation, not state legislation, but kind of low-key regional uh, legislation of semi-arbitrary manner. Yeah? So, well, the, 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 there is no easy answer to it. I suppose uh, the, the very activity of publishing, doing things within the, 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 the framework uh, of the legislation as exists now, yeah, there is the, the state in Poland cannot uh, uh, prohibit uh, uh, Silesia progress uh, uh, to stop publishing stuff in Silesia if, if they want. Yeah. Uh, so this can be done. It will, and it will not be preserved by schools or provided in schools. It will not cause that there is certainly the possibility of writing a dissertation in Silesian, mm -hmm. which was the case 2019 mm -hmm. in, in, in Danzig at the university there in Kashubia. Yeah. So basically, it is holding on, or um, yeah, to a to a policy which is not helping to develop uh, or support by the yeah. by the state the thing which is so far called a cultural heritage of Polish because it's claimed to be a dialect. So on the other hand, we have just a dialect. But then, a dialect which is not supported, right? So, <laughs> not a single uh, Polish yeah. dialect is supported. Uh, if, if you what is the cultural if, heritage of if, Polish? If, then? if you if you look at how dialects were uh, uh, construed and assessed in sociological and uh, party literature during communist Poland, the idea was that they should die out and everyone should start speaking standard uh, uh, Polish, which, which is a bit different from the German approach, yeah, but similar to the French approach. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I would ask the last question, which will bring us far away from Europe to Texas, because there are the settlers coming from Australia, actually from my area, um, and from your area as well. So, Silesian Texans, right? Silesian Texans is there the self description brought back to Texas in late 1980s by the priest Frank Kujai, who is from Slavicice, going there, sent there by the bishop. My question is because they are claimed to be Polish, and whenever they approach Polish people and speak with them Silesian, calling themselves that they speak Polish towards Polish people speaking Polish and they call it what they speak, Warsawian, there is no communication happening or very rarely communication possible. They switch easily into English, right? Mm -hmm. Would you say it is possible to, how can I say that, rephrase the narrative or change the narrative of Silesian Texans to call them Silesians or people from Upper Silesia using Silesian language uh, instead of saying and pretending that there are still Polish people because there was last year open this institution called Polish Heritage Center with the main focus not on the Silesian settlements which are surrounded by, I mean, close to San Antonio, Texas 
but which uh, the main topic of the building is the Polonia in America. Polonia so, minority. Yeah, the emphasizing, the emphasizing those colonies close to Chicago, Houston, and other parts of America. So basically, isn't that, I mean, would you say it is possible to deconstruct the history, I mean, the narratives of the history which has been provided? Or is it um, a Sisyphus work? Like, uh, it will be too complicated to convince the people. Well, obviously, everything is possible when it comes to this uh, attitude. You know? Groups of people are always, all the time, change their attitudes. Uh, they identify with thing A, and then after uh, two, three generations, they identify with thing B. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just depends uh, on, the, on, the, on the targeted group of people, uh, if they are interested in that, if, if they need it for something, and uh, if there is someone explaining it uh, to them clearly as a kind of a choice. Do you want this choice or do you want that choice? Or maybe we, we have uh, both uh, choices. Truly Tru Tru speaking, this uh, uh, Texas Silesians, uh, when you go and look at uh, uh, the, the letters of the uh, leaders when they left, I guess, 1846, yeah? Uh, uh, until 54. 54, yeah. Uh, so ba ba basically it was uh, very freshly after the end of serfdom, so they had this kind of estate identity, yeah. So they were not noblemen, yeah. Uh, yet uh, they were coming from Prussia. So they were, it was still before the founding of Germany, so they were, in, in, in the letters, they were referring to themselves as, as, as Prussians, and there was no question they would uh, 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 refer to themselves as uh, Poles. But, uh, like, uh, uh, five years before they left for Texas, uh, Polish was introduced as the language of early, uh, years of the elementary school and as the uh, language of pastoral uh, 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 service. So they, some of them, and they priests, they, they, they were using Polish, but at that time it was not uh, a marker of identity. But then, uh, in the late 19th century, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, settlers from Austria-Hungary, from Galicia, and uh, from the Russian Empire, uh, from the Kingdom of Poland, uh, uh, Polish clergy, uh, self-consciously Polish, were going uh, uh, to the United States and were establishing this kind of parallel Polish uh, language uh, uh, parishes. And uh, uh, they were kind of co-opted, yeah? <laughs> so that, that would happen. There was no... Uh, 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 priests coming from the Breslau diocese and establishing uh, uh, German or Silesian uh, or Prussian uh, uh, parallel Catholic parishes uh, for multilingual Silesians. Now it is kind of happening with Father Kujai and well, what, what will it mean for the future? I can only speculate, but there is the example of the Kashubian mm. settlement in Canada called Vilno, yeah, so fun name you could say, and uh, they went through the through a very similar process. Yeah, they identified when they in the 1860s, 1870s migrated uh, from uh, Prussia uh, to uh, Canada as Prussians, then as Kashubians. Uh, then, because of the activities of uh, uh, Polish priests from Galicia and the uh, and Congress Kingdom of Poland, uh, they got co-opted for the Polish uh, Catholic Church. Yet, uh, in the 80s, there were some kind of scholars coming from Kashubia to uh, Vilno, Canada, and kind of talking to them, doing research. And nowadays, many identify as uh, Kashubians, but uh, truly speaking, very few of them are active in Kashubian. But they are basically uh, Kashubian Canadians now, yeah? So 
Yeah, but yeah. what if the explanation was say Asian meats in Texas is too complicated as we can see here to a person who is not familiar with the whole topic, like the construction of what the mixture of identities, cultural identities, national identities in Europe means, especially in areas where the borders change very often, like in Silesia, every 200 years a new ruler had power over this territory, uh, which actually lasted in the, uh, um, it, how would I say, a indifferent connection to nationalism. Every 200 years you have a new state, basically, so people said, okay, we are we, that's it, right? And in that explanation, would you say that for Americans who are um, in the American educational system, in the American environment, and the American identity, would you say that they're able to understand this complexity of the upper side Asian modern identity? Well, obviously it doesn't make sense to them because the identity is through uh, citizenship, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, uh, truly speaking, that's one of, of the difficulties which I have to teach Central Europe to American students, yeah? Because to, to them it's a kind of mind-boggling that people can identify through language. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That actually nation in Central Europe is not the same as state. And you know, the difficulty goes the other way around too. When I was still 20 years ago teaching in Poland, I, it was very difficult for my students to explain that the Americans have a nation and they have identity, but they don't have a language of their own and they speak in English. Uh, my Polish students had problems uh, to get it. But, you know, it's, it's kind of sociological fact. In different uh, uh, areas of the, of the modern world, people use different elements uh, of cultural reality to shape uh, their identity. So, in the Balkans until today, uh, the religion is uh, 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 very important. Yeah? So, like in Bulgaria, you have nowadays Turks. Yeah? Uh, and it is not language which makes them into Turks, but their religion, which is Islam. Yeah. Thank you for that answer, but um, since it's already dark, the question is, are there any questions from your side? If, how, how do you feel? Because I cannot see your faces if you're ready to bore, tired, whatsoever. Uh, could you tell us, do you have any questions, yes or not? Would you rather have, like, we could finish here, move on, for example, somewhere else? <laughs> or would you like to stay and in this cozy atmosphere uh, continue the conversation? Well, we can go to the other place, bring what they do in the other place here to have a cozy discussion with the stuff that comes from the other okay. place. But you, would you say you have questions? Or is it... Are you overloaded with information for now? <laughs> is something unclear for this? Everything is, uh, is unclear, but uh, <laughs> I have one question. Uh, so it seems to me that the language is at the end the, the, the most important vector for the, for the uh, Silesian identity at, at the end. So, it seems to me that it's a, that it's a fact because this, uh, this uh, German identity, identity it, um, it's, it, it does not have a okay, it does not have a linguistic substance. I, I understand it, but, but is there some, something else? Uh, I don't know. It's uh, that there are stories in the, the families, maybe. I don't know. It's very important, of course. But now, for now, for, for the for I the if I might ask. I mean, um, answer that question with um, the German term Jein. Jein is the best answer to this because contemporary literature produced in Polish about Silesia like Kais from Rokita and from Twardo, those are two people who actually learn or regain the ability of use uh, Silesian as a language. Mm -hmm. So they produce information about, information about Silesia in Polish while after that, they claim we are the one Fardo said Silesian, even though my Silesian is broken. And uh, Rokita, who says he's Polish and Silesian, right? So I, I'd say, and there is this situation where the discussion in Katowice is about I don't speak Silesian, but I feel Silesian, mm -hmm. which 
for the Apollo region is a bit strange because I know that for people in my area you have to speak it to be it something like it, I would say it's the traditional perspective on that um, but to be honest I also li I, I like uh, the one which is provided in Katowice even though I'm a speaker of the language so I don't mind if the person is approaching me and saying he feels Silesian or is Silesian uh, as long as the person is capable uh, of understanding what I'm saying, right? Um, and the person gives me the feeling, okay, for you, what is for you Silesian or be Silesian? Or are you interested in the topic? When I feel a person who says that if that person is Silesian but has strong issues with German, I don't know why, but I second guess that person. For me, even though I know that person speaks it and whatsoever, I have struggles to, to have a certain attachment to that person because I said, yeah, you are missing out on a big part of history and culture on what or how the identity has been created. That is from my perspective. But I would, I would put out those two people like Tvardov and Trokita who actually produce certain things, lots of things basically, who approach the uh, public and <clears throat> made this issue visible in the last three, four, five, seven years. Um, but still, the whole discussions with them are held in Polish, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's answering your question, because it is a sign of that the language is not only a part of it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. rather as histories sat about the people, about the area, about the issues, about whatever is uh, to be told, right? Mm -hmm. to making the situation a topic which okay, is discussed. So, uh, yes, yes. But, but, but my question was a kind of question, mm -hmm. the answer is a kind of answer. I understand, okay, it's okay. But, you know, if there are uh, books uh, being published in, in, in the uh, in the Silesian uh, language now, mm -hmm. so uh, do they try to establish a standard for this for this language? Because the Silesian a language is uh, is a sammelsurium yeah. of of dialects of different dialects and, uh, and there are differences. So, to my opinion, uh, there are big difference between the different areas where yeah. it's uh, spoken. So, me, me as a not not a linguist, I would like to reply to that question, but I will be curious on listening to what Professor Kamzala has to say. I like to say it's a pluricentric, a pluri pluricentric language. So, if you expect Silesian to be one standard, like Polish or like German in Germany, then you are on the wrong path. I would say it's a pluricentric language. So, how you describe the language, how you codify the language, it will be understood by the other person. Yes, yes, yes that's what I understand. But 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 if you if you start to publish books yeah. in this language, so. Normally, you need a standard. So it's like in Germany, you don't publish books in Bavarian. I sure. Or in court trades, which you can so It's a great pity, of course, but you don't do that. I mean, well, you need the standard. You need standard for, for language, for, for literature, for example. What, what is the standard? I don't, I don't think that you need it. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but how would you define that? By the alphabet, or by the words used, or by the grammar? By because everything. Yeah, but then you expect to be one language, as I said, a monocentric language. And, mm -hmm. and what do you do with those people who don't say sh but say si? Will you yes. ignore that fact? No. So no, I'd say... I don't, no, no, I don't expect anything. Yeah. My question is uh, whether the, 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 the writers and so on, but they, the authors, For now? they try to establish a standard. So that's my question. For now? I don't think that we, we need a standard in that. Such a language dialect, this and then yeah. other languages too. But do they try? To do For this? now, writers use the way how they speak and they codify it that way. Mm -hmm. Those who are analyzing that from the grammatical side, like providing um, workbooks, they include, like Kalus, every version he found, or like Kulik, mm -hmm. every version he found in his corpus, which he took into analyzing okay. the So. You have the word say set in this, this, and that matter. Mm -hmm. So there are different approaches. And, yeah, and there is there is the scholar called Hendrik Jaroszewicz. Mm -hmm. He is working currently, I guess, on the grammar, isn't he? Mm -hmm. oh. So basically, this is happening, but how far he is, 
Finish. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, yeah. uh, basically, there are no authorities controlling uh, the Silesian language, like in Germany okay. or in some other countries. So you have a situation like in the case of the, the English language. And no one is controlling the English language. So uh, once again, uh, when it comes to deciding what is more correct or less correct in English, is the number of users using mm -hmm. it. Yeah? So uh, you have a similar situation in uh, Asia. Obviously, when you have a publishing industry, uh, you don't want to do everything differently yeah? because it's kind of unsustainable, especially if the market is so small. So the, uh, the handful of uh, proofreaders uh, of Silesian, who is how many? I don't know, four, five, uh, they by uh, the fact of proofreading the books which go for publication in a way, uh, in some kind of uh, not uh, uh, no informal manner, they, they, they kind of create the standard because uh, 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 Henrik Jaroszewicz, whom, or Henrik Jaroszewicz, as he likes uh, referring to himself from the University of Wrocław, he uh, took all the books published in the standard spelling system uh, which was uh, established in 2009 so around 50 books during the last 10 years were published. Uh, he kind of created a corpus of words and uh, uh, grammatical constructions uh, used in these books. And uh, what is visible, there is a certain tendency emerging yeah, that uh, some things are used more often and some things are used less often. So, yeah, the very fact of producing something uh, for, for a market kind of pushes it one way or the other. Uh, and obviously such a standard uh, sooner or later will emerge uh, depending on the volume of production and the volume of consumption, not only of printed matter in uh, in the Silesian language, but also other products like songs, uh, like uh, uh, yeah, t t TV programs or uh, video clips. And actually, uh, Adam is uh, pushing it the other way around. Yeah? He is kind of pushing it the way of the German minority. You, the German minority, use Silesian with uh, uh, a lot of Silesian uh, German language. Uh, uh, alone, so uh, why not uh, to write it down uh, too and uh, create fiction, create books, because, uh, well, uh, uh, it is your language, <laughs> you use it in everyday life and people like to see themselves re reflected uh, uh, in, in, in fiction, in poetry, because that's what literature is about, yeah. <laughs> And the, the interesting fact is how many people from Upper Silesia live actually in Germany, like the Spät of Siegler. At home they speak both languages, right? German and Silesia. Mm -hmm. In many families, maybe not in all, but in many. So, uh, people approaching me in Silesia, there were like a couple of people visiting Silesia back then, when I had my readings there. They said, you wrote it down in the Silesian way how we speak it in Germany. The German terms in the Silesian language. So, I know that it's, it has been, um, some people say it's not the way how we speak it. I said, yeah, but there are some people using that mm -hmm. way of, or even some others said, it was just how my parents and we as kids used to speak it in the 50s, 60s, with lots of German loan words, and, yeah. and this is how I so used that while having visitors from Germany who were able to speak Silesian, practicing both languages. So, we did like half a sentence in German, half of it in Silesia, and sometimes a mixture of both, which was fine as long as it was understood by the other side. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, your book could be sought here because uh, uh, between 1952 and 1992, around 800,000 people left uh, uh, Upper Silesia for West Germany. So these people are here. I just rem remember very clearly when. Uh, in the late 90s, I visited my godfather uh, in Hamburg, and, and, and he left in '85. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, 
he had this kind of club of old opas yeah, meeting, so he brought me along because his sinner came from Upper uh, uh, Silesia. And uh, at first, in the restaurant, there was this kind of talking in German, the standard German. Uh, it was kind of ossified, uh, not going very well. Then they had several schnapses and they switched into Silesian, and then the real conversation started. <laughs> So it was day language. <laughs> so if there are no other questions, I would call it here, I mean here, at this moment, say thank you to, for your time, thank you for coming to Heidelberg, uh, to, to giving us this lecture and the whole possibility of emphasizing the topic of the Asian minorities. As much as for you, the audience, the people who came and actually showed a certain interest, even though it might have been, um, has been too complicated or new, which I hope uh, will continue in our private discussions later on. And um, to Artes Liberales Universitas, even though uh, <laughs> by accident we have been, have been um, provided this cozy atmosphere without... Um, Come on, <laughs> it's a I hope so. Moment, everyone will remember it for long. In the middle of the old town of Heidelberg. So thank you very much for coming, and who is willing of continuing this discussion in one of the pub bars or somewhere in the town, please stay. And at this moment, thank you very much for coming. So I also thank you, and uh, I recommend strongly Adam's book, because half of it is in German, the rest in Silesian, but uh, uh, so more than 150 is in German, 80 is in Silesian, oh, okay. and, and a couple of pages, well done. And a couple of pages from Professor R in English, so you have the introduction to the region of English. Yeah, this is actually, yeah. that was the idea of the book. So. Lass die Kerzen erstmal, nicht noch, noch nicht ausmachen, oh ja. damit wir halt sehen, was wir hier tun. Ne?